Hello all, I am Dr. Pawan Yadav. I am a consultant pulmonologist at Astor RV Hospital, JP Nagar, Bangalore. Today I will be talking about one of the very significant lung problems. It's called as interstitial lung disease. Interstitial lung disease is not a very common disease. However, the impact it has on the lifestyle and the performance of the patient is very significant because it's a chronic lung disease which continues to progress and makes the patient completely dependent upon oxygen by pap therapy over a period of time. So before understanding what ILD is, let's try to understand how a normal lung functions. So when we normally breathe in, we breathe in air through either nose or mouth and that air goes through the throat into the trachea, into the windpipe and into the lungs. So inside of the lungs, there are air sacs called as alveoli, wherein the gas exchange happens between oxygen and carbon dioxide. The oxygen in the air that we breathe in is transferred to the body and the carbon dioxide which is produced as a byproduct of metabolism is thrown out into the air sacs which is exhaled out. So in between these air sacs inside the lungs, there is a small space called as interstitium wherein there are small blood vessels which are present between the air sacs through which the air exchange happens. In patients suffering with interstitial lung disease, this interstitium becomes thickened either because of the inflammatory cells or because of the deposition of a fibrous tissue. We can simply call it as a scarring process which replaces the normal lung parenchyma or the normal lung tissue with, uh, with a tissue, with a scar tissue which is non-functional. And this process of replacing of the fibrous tissue of the normal lung tissue is progressive and it can continue to progress until the patient becomes severely debilitated. So what are the symptoms in patients with interstitial lung disease? So they usually present with dry cough, breathing difficulty, exertional breathlessness, going on to become oxygen dependent. Initially, patient may become breathless after walking for a long distance or climbing steps or a steep height or this patient may become oxygen dependent while at rest as well. Initially, the oxygen requirement may be very minimal of 0.5 to 1 liter, which may slowly increase and slowly they may require up to 4 liters, 5 liters and may be very high oxygen requirement thereafter. Such patients may start to retain carbon dioxide when the damage to the lung is significant and in the later part, later phase of the disease, they may even require BiPAP support at home, which is almost like an artificial ventilator or a smaller version of that which we use for patients at home. Along with this, this patient requires repeated hospitalization because even a small infection which is otherwise not a big deal for people may become a significant problem in this group of people and they may have significant worsening of the lung condition requiring hospital admissions and prolonged stay in the hospital and even ICU admissions uh, later on followed by ward admission and discharges. So thereby affecting their overall uh, lifestyle and poor performance as such. Now, how do we diagnose interstitial lung disease? So basically, initially we suspect it on a physical examination, thereby followed by taking a chest x-ray and further confirmation happens with the help of a CT thorax. The CT scan of the lungs in, uh, tells us about the different patterns of interstitial lung disease. So there's a, there's a large spectrum of interstitial lung disease and uh, which may happen because of many reasons. So what are the possible reasons why a person may develop interstitial lung disease? So most common would be to ask questions like, is there any previous exposure to dust or smoke at the workplace, which may be occupational exposure? Second is, is there an exposure to a bird dust or maybe organic dust as we call it as, which may be happening at the household there may be birds sitting on the shelf and causing pigeon droppings, etc., which on chronic inhalation can cause lung fibrosis. The third group of conditions are called as autoimmune condition, wherein body starts producing antibodies, which attacks the normal cells in the body, including also the cells in the lungs, which can lead to inflammation initially, followed by a fibrotic process leading on to interstitial lung disease. Finally, there are a group of conditions for which we don't know the cause as to why it happens and we call them as idiopathic 
pulmonary fibrosis wherein the cause is really not known but the disease continues to progress causing significant distress to the patients. Now, how do we confirm the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease? It depends upon a detailed history, physical examination, to look for any signs of connective tissue disorders and also to do certain blood tests for autoimmune workup uh, and uh, thereby after that if all the reports and history is not conclusive of a particular diagnosis they may, uh, may require to undergo a procedure to take a biopsy from the lung tissue to examine it under a microscope to get a detailed evaluation of the lung tissue in order to make an appropriate diagnosis. So once an appropriate diagnosis is made the, the fact here is very simple we just have to see whether it's an inflammatory ILD versus a fibrotic ILD. In an inflammatory ILD that means inflammation is still going on we may have to suppress that inflammation with the help of steroid or anti-inflammatory agents. If the fibrosis has already set in the goal is to prevent the further progression of fibrosis by using antifibrotic agents. This is in brief the summary of the medical management and as the patient de becomes dependent upon oxygen therapy or BiPAP therapy we just have to manage them on these things and since they are more susceptible to develop infections which can become a severe form of pneumonia requiring hospital admission we should make sure that they are adequately vaccinated for all the viral and the pneumococcal infections which are the most common ones. So now after this once the patient becomes oxygen, and dep oxygen dependent and BiPAP dependent at home they tend to become bed bound with their physical activity gets severely limited. So this leads to severe mus muscle wasting, severe osteoporosis and uh, poor nutritional status of the patient lead leading on to poor BMI and weight loss. So here comes the most important aspect of pulmonary rehabilitation wherein we want to make the patient to be active as much as possible with the help of oxygen support with the help of BiPAP support we want to keep them as active as possible and there is a huge program which is involved in this process which is a significant part of uh, any good uh, lung transplantation program as such or any pulmonary uh, any pulmonology department which aims to become a good lung transplantation center. So here a detailed assessment is done about the physical aspect, the physical strength of the patient, whether there is any muscular weakness of the limbs, of the girdle weakness, respiratory muscular weaknesses, etc. And a targeted physiotherapy is started in order to keep the muscle, muscles in good shape. And most of them do have osteoporosis, so we have to replace them. The calcium replacement has to be given, vitamin D replacement has to be given. And nutritionally, if they are depleted, they have to be adequately replaced with good amount of nutrition to make them uh, come into good shape so that they have the energy to do the physiotherapy and stay in good shape. So after all these things, after all the, all the optimal medical management in terms of oxygen therapy, BiPAP therapy, medications, pulmonary rehabilitation and dietary management. If the disease continues to progress and the patient becomes slowly bed bound and continues to become more and more debilitated, then we have to consider the option of lung transplantation in this case. So that's the final option we have. And pulmonary uh, and lung transplantation has become the, uh, the standard norm for people with advanced lung diseases so also in case of interstitial lung disease. So when do you consider lung transplantation in, in patients of ILD? So when the patient becomes more and more oxygen dependent and when the patient start retaining carbon dioxide and when the patient start having uh, repeated hospital admissions and when the patient becomes uh, severely debilitated and become, start becoming uh, you know, limited to the chair or the bed. This, this is the time wherein we start thinking and uh, start uh, considering him for lung transplantation. Even on, uh, other investigations like ECHO may give us the information of a right heart strain and when we do a pulmonary function test uh, serially it may show a, a progressive drop in the lung function or when you do a DLCO there may be a progressive decline in the values of DLCO and when you do other tests like 6 minute walk tests, patient may not be able to adequately walk and the amount of distance he walks may become lesser and lesser leading to more severe drop in the levels of oxygen. So these are all the parameters that we have to consider as clinicians to decide as to when it may be an ideal time for a patient to be considered for lung transplantation. Thank you.